I want to talk to you about what parts of the Bible should you read. And you'd be shocked about how many people have this question. What parts of the Bible should you read? First, if you want to look at 1 Timothy 4, look at 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul gets into how in the latter times that men will depart from the faith. So how can you be sure that you're not going to be in that group? And now look down at verse 6. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6. He says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying of worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So if you followed along in that, you probably noticed some things. For example, in verse 6, he said to be nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Nourished up in the words of faith. In verse 8, it says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You know, don't worry about exercising this body so much. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. He said in verse 13, till I come give attendance to reading, to doctrine. He said in verse 15, meditate upon these things. He says, give thyself wholly unto them. And he said, continue in them. And to do these things, you're going to have to get a King James Bible, preferably a wide margin Bible, and live in it. Live in it more than you do your apartment. Live in it more than you do your office. Many times I've heard people say that there are parts of the Bible that you don't have to read. Or they will say, you know, I don't see why you have to read the whole thing. Or I've been reading a, reading a certain book of the Bible and they're like, wow, why are you reading that? So I just wanted to talk about what parts of the Bible should you read. Well, you need to read all of it. And I can prove to you with the Bible that you need to read all of it. And since Genesis is the beginning of it, I guess that's where we'll start. You need to read the book of Genesis. In Matthew 19, 4, Jesus said, it says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read, have ye not read, that he, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Je Jesus commonly asked men, the question, have you not read? Here he says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? That was back in Genesis. He made Adam and Eve. And this shows me he expects me to read Genesis. He said to these people, have you not read? I mean, that is the Old Testament, but it tells me where I came from. It tells me how we got in this mess that we're in. And maybe one reason people believe in evolution and don't know that God made them male and female instead of male and male or female and female is because people forsook Genesis a long time ago. Maybe people think that we came from a, a rock or uh, some type of animal or monkey is because they, they forsook Genesis a long time ago. They refused to read and believe Genesis. Reading Genesis is so beneficial because it tells you where you came from, why you're here, why the world is in a mess, and you realize that things haven't always been like they are now. I mean, in Genesis, they lived to be 900 and something years old for a time. 
Some of the most exciting stories are in Genesis. I mean, the story of Noah and the ark. That's still a huge thing today. People talk about it today. Everybody knows about Noah and the ark. I mean, all the great stories in Genesis. How can you not read the book of Genesis? Jesus himself expected these people to have read Genesis. He said, have you not read? Do you know what else he expects you to read? Exodus through Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He says in Matthew 12, 5, or have you not read in the law? Have you not read in the law? That would be the books of Moses. Genesis through Deuteronomy. How have you? He said, have, have you not read in the law? How that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? The Lord was like, you guys are supposed to be the geniuses of your day. And have you not even read in the law about this? Probably not. You see, you have a bunch of religious people out there today who look down on common, simple, nobody people like us, like we don't have any sense. Yet they don't know half of what you know because you read the Bible and they don't. They just got their tradition. I mean, they're very, they, they major in their tradition. And they might could argue you to death about things that pertain to their tradition. But when it comes right down to it, to sit and have a, uh, uh, a talk about the Bible, they would have no idea what you're talking about. And when they jump your back about something unbiblical, just say, like the Lord said, you know, have you not read? Have you not read in the law? Have you not read about this? Have you not read back there in Genesis? That's how you get them. In Matthew, or in Mark 12, 26, Jesus said, And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses? You see, that's how Jesus Christ handled these people. It was all about the book. Have you not read in the book of Moses? If you didn't have any Bible, then he thought you didn't have really any room to talk or to make an argument. Have you... Not read Genesis through Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Jesus read it. Paul, the Apostle Paul, our Apostle, obviously read it. Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 9, 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Paul was reading the books of Moses. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, a, a couple chapters later, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So we're supposed to follow Paul when he, as he followed Jesus Christ. Well, both Paul and Jesus Christ read the books of Moses. And if Paul read it, and even went away for a while and got alone for about three years when he first got saved... He probably had the whole thing memorized of, the, of what Bible he had, the Old Testament. He had the Old Testament, and we know he read it because he quoted it so much. So have you not read Genesis? Have you not read Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy? Have you not read how God raised up a deliverer for Israel, which was Moses, and got them out of Egypt? And sent the plagues on Pharaoh and sent them across the Red Sea on dry ground and was with them for 40 years in the wilderness. And all those crazy stories that happened to them, they were bit by serpents. They, they had all kinds of crazy stuff happen. They, he dropped down manna from heaven. Have you not read all those amazing story, stories where Phineas takes a javelin and pierces through the body of, of this uh, demon-possessed woman? You know, all these cool stories back there. Have you not read those? Jesus expects you to. Have you not read Joshua and Judges and Ruth? Well, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, verse 45, well, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's pretty much giving you this history of the Old Testament, specifically about Israel, and he mentions Joshua. 
That shows me he's read Joshua. He said, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers into the days of David. He said that after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. In Acts 7.45, Joshua is called Jesus because they are the same name. And this is Stephen telling you all about the history of the Old Testament in Israel. He obviously read all about Joshua. Read Joshua and note how that all of the battles will picture the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and Joshua, who's called Jesus here, is a picture of the Lord Jesus. He's a picture of Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming. When you're reading Joshua, you're not just reading history, you are reading the future. Stephen read it. You want to be amazed, interested, intrigued, fascinated, creeped out a little bit? Read the book of Judges, the strangest book of the whole Bible. Paul talks about the Judges in Hebrews. He must have got some encouragement from the book of Judges. It says in Hebrews 11.32, he said, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. He read of Gideon, the judge, Barak, the judge, Samson, the judge, Jephthah. Jephthah was a judge. You know, do you remember the sword of the Lord and of Gideon? You remember Barak and Deborah? You remember Samson, the strongest man, Jephthah, that made that horrible vow and ended up having to kill his daughter? I love to read about Samson and how he tied the 300 foxtails together and set them on fire. I love to read how he slew 1,000 men with the jawbone of an ass. Jet Li, Jackie Chan, all them guys wouldn't have nothing on him. In the book of Ruth, it took place during the time of Judges. She was a Moabite, and Moabites are the enemies of God. She became a friend of God, though. And that book pictures how me and you were once an enemy of God, but because of Jesus Christ, we were redeemed and became the friend of God. And in Ruth, she was redeemed by Boaz. Boaz, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. She married Boaz, and she married into the line of Jesus Christ. Because if you read Matthew chapter 1, you see Ruth is in the line of the Lord Jesus. She's mentioned there. Have you not read Joshua? Have you not read Judges? Have you not read Ruth? Have you not read Genesis through Deuteronomy? Have you not read 1 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles? Jesus expects you to read it. He wrote it himself and compiled it and he put it right there in front of you on the table and he said in Matthew 12 3 he said but he said unto them have you not read what David did there he is with that saying again have you not read what David did we've already seen where he said have you not read about in the beginning have you not read the book of Mos books of Moses have you not read what David did do you know anything that David did other than killing Goliath? Well, he did all kinds of other stuff too. Do you want to know about the sons of David and his son, King Solomon? Did you know that King Solomon was David's son? The wisest man that ever lived, King Solomon. Do you want to know about the wicked kings and the exciting stories and how they are all compared to King David? then you got to read First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Read the books of the kings. In Matthew chapter 1, you'll see how Jesus Christ is in the line of the kings because he is the tribe of Judah. He's of the tribe of Judah, and David is of the tribe of Judah. Read through the books of the kings. Familiarize yourself with those Old Testament kings. And then when you read Matthew chapter 1, it's going to make a lot more sense. Uh, the Bible is about kings and kingdoms. It's about who's on the throne. Most of the time, when you read those uh, books of the kings, you got a wicked king on the throne. And the people serve him more than they serve God. The king is serving himself and false gods more than he's serving God, if he's serving God at all. 
Today, it's the same thing. Today, you have a throne on your heart, in your heart. And examine your heart. Is Jesus Christ on that throne? Or are you on that throne in your heart? Read the books of the kings. Have you not read about the kings and looked at their life and how they messed up and examine your life and see if you're like them or if you're like King David? Have you not read the kings? Have you not read the book of Job? You know, James has read all about Job. James, in the New Testament, in James 5.11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And I have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Surely you've heard of the patience of Job, right? You know, when you're going through hard times and you think you have it bad, you've heard of the patience of Job, I'm, I'm sure, and you've seen how he handled it. He didn't curse God. He lost his friends. His wife went crazy. His kids died. I mean, you've heard of the patience of Job. You've heard about the story. I'm sure you have. How Satan approaches God to get permission to destroy Job. Have you not read it? Not even once. I wanted to make sure that my daughter heard it at least once. And so when she was like two months old, I set her in a real comfortable uh, padded rocking chair. And I set her up. She couldn't even set up herself yet. But I set her up and t uh, tucked a pillow next to her so she wouldn't fall over. And I read her the whole book of Job. And she just sit there and just smiled at me. You say, well, that don't count because she didn't understand. Well, the Bible's supernatural, and the words got in her. And, I mean, I've dumped gallons and gallons of seed of the Word of God in her heart over the past six years or so, and it got in my heart as I read it to her. There's no, it's not a waste of time to read the Bible, even if you don't understand it, even if your mind is drifting off. I believe the Bible's supernatural, and it's like you're just putting that in you, and it's going in you, and it doesn't come back out unless you, unless the devil comes in and tries to get it out of your heart. But you, you can set it up in there where he can't get it. Have you never read Job? Have you never read Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and the, these wisdom, great wisdom books. These are the wisdom books. People today don't have any wisdom. You know, a, a gray-headed, a, a gray head don't mean nothing no more. You know, there's all types of people with a gray head, and they're just as dumb as a box of rocks, just as dumb as the, as the twenty-year-old. I, I know some gray-headed people in the workplace. They act just like they did when they were twenty. Or actually, I didn't know them when they were twenty. But the way they act now, I would have hated to see them when they were 20. If people even want to get rid of their gray hair. Some of them might need to because it's supposed to be a sign of wisdom and they don't even have any. Maybe some of them, they need to dye it black or something because, you know, they're, mis they're misrepresenting the gray head. Some of them need to dye it blacker than one of these gothic emo style looking people who's a, like a lead singer of those death metal bands or something. Because they're really misrepresenting what the gray head should be representing. You know, with all that getting, you need to get wisdom. And you know what Jesus said in Luke 24, 44? It says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus Christ read the Psalms. He knew all about it. He even said it was about himself. He declared the things in it concerned him. You know, read through the Psalms and keep in mind that it's got Jesus all the way through it. Read Psalm 22 and think about the Lord Jesus. Read the book of Psalms and realize that it's more than just something to give you comfort and to make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside in certain places like in Psalm 23, you know that that's about the tribulation too as, as well. It's not just to give you comfort. You know, in the tribulation, there's going to be people that's really walking through a valley of the shadow of death and there's going to be some type of thing in the, in the sky. And if they get under that shadow, 
It's like a death machine. They just die. But the saints, when they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, they're going to fear no evil because they got God. You see, the Bible's got so many applications. And you can read Psalms and you think, well, you're just getting comfort out of it. No, it's not just comfort. Those things in Psalms, it's got application and doctrine for the tribulation and the millennium. And it's got types and pictures of the Lord Jesus in there. Some of the craziest, wildest things you'll find in Psalms. But have you not read Psalms? Have you not read the wisdom books? Have you not read the Proverbs? Well, Peter read the Proverbs in Second Peter 2.22. It says, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Peter read the Proverbs. They say a proverb a day will keep the devil away. I don't know about that, but uh, I believe a proverb a day will put a damper on the old man, the flesh. It will be like taking a shotgun and shooting the old man back to his grave where he belongs. You see, your flesh likes to rise up out of the grave, even though he's already dead. Take a proverb. Hide behind a tombstone and shoot him. It will push him back bit by bit until he just falls in. Read the Proverbs. Solomon was given wisdom by the Lord. He was David's son. He had a lot of sense. He wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And Jesus knew all about Solomon. He read all his stuff. He even speaks about Solomon's wisdom. In Luke eleven thirty one, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the uttermost part, utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus knew all about Solomon. He talked about the wisdom of Solomon. You think he hadn't read Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, you think he doesn't expect you to read it? You need to get a hold of those wisdom books. Or have you not read the Minor Prophets? Paul did. In Romans 9.25, as he saith also in Osi. Osi, that's Hosea. Paul was reading Hosea. You think Hosea is not important? Uh, Luke records how Peter... Uh, when he's when Peter was preaching in Acts 2, look what Peter says in Acts 2, 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You think those three little chapters back there in Joel aren't important? Or what about Jonah? Jesus loved the story of Jonah and the whale. He knew it was a type of himself. He said in Matthew twelve thirty nine through 40, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a son, and there shall, shall no son be given to it but the son of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He knew all about Jonah. Those minor prophets are just minor because they are small, but they aren't less important. Those minor prophets are chocked full of verses about the tribulation and the second coming. Where, where do you think about Isaiah and the major prophets? Where do you, th you know how Jesus said, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched? Where do you think the Lord Jesus read that from? What do you think he's quoting? Well, he's quoting Isaiah. Isaiah 66, 24 where it says, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. The Lord Jesus was a Bible reader. If he was quoting Isaiah that much, I think he was spending a lot of time in Isaiah. I think that excited him, reading Isaiah. And he probably, I, not, not just probably, I, I'm absolutely certain that he saw the second coming, the tribulation, and the millennium all throughout the book of Isaiah. I would love to have a dispensational truth book by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It would knock Clarence Larkin's book out of the park. Jesus read the prophets. He would have read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. But have you not read the prophets? Have you not read those 
major prophets and the minor prophets? Have you not read the Gospels? The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Peter would expect you to. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. If you don't read the Gospels, then you won't see how Jesus suffered for you, walked this wicked world for you, was tempted in all points like as we are for you, bled and died for you, was buried and resurrected for you. You see, Peter got to walk and talk with Jesus and witness it face to face, but he calls the Bible a more sure word of prophecy. And reading about what Jesus did in the Bible is even better than being there because it's more sure. And in Matthew, it shows you that Jesus is king. In the Gospel of Mark, it shows you that he's a servant. In Luke, it shows you the man Christ Jesus. In John, it shows you Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh. And when you read all four of them Gospels, it gives you a, a complete picture. Have you not read the Gospels? Have you not read the book of Acts and how it transitions you from the Jew to the church, from Israel to the church? Have you not read that? Have you not read the Pauline epistles? That's where the, you find the doctrine for you today. Do you know who read Paul? Peter did. In 2 Peter 3.15, in 16, it says in an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. He said, Our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Even though Paul withstood Peter to the face in Galatians, you know, and confronted him about his hypocrisy, he still didn't miss reading the Pauline epistles. Just because Paul might rub you the wrong way sometimes doesn't mean you don't need to read the Pauline epistles. Uh, Paul wrote letters to churches. He wrote letters to young preachers that he mentored like Timothy and Titus. And he wanted others to read the epistles and not just the person or people that they were wrote to specifically. In Colossians 4.16, for example, he says, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. So he wanted the Laodiceans to read the church from the Colossians, to read the epistle to the Colossians. And then he says, And that likewise ye read the epistle from Laodicea. The Lord wants to be sure that your church also reads the epistle to the Colossians, to the Thessalonians, to the Corinthians. He said in Ephesians 3, 3 through 4, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He said when you read, he's, expect, he's taking for granted you're going to read it. He, he's expecting you to read it. He's not saying if you read. He said when you read. If Paul was here today, he would expect you to read what the Lord had him write. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. What about Revelation? In Revelation 1, 3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The book of Revelation promises you a blessing just for reading it. I've had people come up to me, see me reading the book of Revelation. You would not believe this. Christians, two of them, not just one, but two, come up to me and ask me why I'm reading the book of Revelation. I'm thinking, what planet are you from? Don't you know Revelation is future? Everything in its future. John was picked up by the Holy Spirit and carried forward in time to see the day of the Lord. The, the, he saw the tribulation, he saw the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, the millennium, the new heavens, the new earth, eternity. Why wouldn't I want to read that? It's like, it's like the Lord just dropped all the newspapers for the future in my lap and, and condensed it down into uh, 22 chapters. Why wouldn't I want to read that? 
Why wouldn't I want to read the general epistles? Why wouldn't I want to read Hebrews, First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John? First John gives you assurance of your salvation. That's why he wrote it. First John tells you how to have joy. Jude, why wouldn't you want to read Jude? Where you find out that, find out something Enoch said. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all of convince all of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You know, that prophecy of Enoch that he, he wrote. You wouldn't have known about that had Jude not recorded it. Why, do, why wouldn't you want to read the book of James? Why wouldn't you want to read the book of Peter? When the, uh, a man who walked and talked with Jesus, had that close relationship with Jesus and went through, you know, saying some things that he shouldn't say and denying the Lord and then ended up preaching and 3,000 people got saved. Why wouldn't you want to read what he wrote. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, referring to the, Paul referring to the Old Testament, he says, now these things were our examples. They were our examples. We should read them. He said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happen unto, uh, happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. He's referring to the things that happened in the Old Testament, written for our examples, our admonition. He said in Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. He said in 2 Corinthians three fourteen, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. You see, when you get saved, you get the the veil off of you and you can go back there in the Old Testament and you can see Jesus Christ on every page. He said in 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, the doctrine, to exhortation. Have you not read? You need to be reading.